And joining us now is the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, Michael Gravel, also the Liberal MPP for Thunder Bay Superior North, and welcome to TVO. Great to be here, Steve. Nice Thank to have you. have you in that chair. Get comfortable in that chair. I got a lot to read before I get to you. Excellent. We have lots of, a bit of background here because I think a lot of our viewers obviously won't necessarily know what you've been up to on the Mining Act and it's important stuff. So let's take a look. Michael, if you would, not you, Minister, I mean the Director. Here is what's in the existing act that you want to change. Prospectors can stake claims on private property without notice. Prospectors can disturb the surface of land without notice. They're not required to restore the land to its previous condition if disturbed. In Aboriginal traditional territories, a claim can be staked, drilling can begin without notification, and consultations only occur in Aboriginal communities if a mine is to be opened. Now, obviously, a lot of people had a problem with that, and therefore, you have brought in some proposed changes, and here's some of the background on that. Most private landowners in Ontario own both the surface <coughs> and the mineral rights on their properties, in, orders, in other words, on top and underneath. Small fraction here, only 1.4% in southern Ontario own only the surface rights and just 0.68% in northern Ontario. And one in 10,000 exploration projects, just one, becomes a working mine. Now, more proposed changes here. For private landowners in southern Ontario, there's a ban on prospecting where surface rights are privately owned. Existing claims are to be upheld. In northern Ontario, private landholders must apply to have their land exempted from prospecting. Exemptions will be based on mineral potential on the land. And enhanced notification is to be given to private landowners after a claim is staked and before exploration begins. One more. Aboriginals, an important part of the new law. <coughs> Some cultural sites are to be exempted from staking. Notification immediately after a claim is staked. Notification if there are plans for significant exploration on traditional lands. And we're not talking reserves here. Those have always been exempt. <coughs> Provisions to restrict exploration activities and increased consultation with Aboriginal communities. Okay, that's a mouthful. You're in second reading right now. I want to know what's the overarching philosophy behind the proposed changes. Well, it, we made a real commitment to modernize the Mining Act. It was actually made by the Premier prior to the last election in 2007 uh, that indeed uh, we needed to update the Act. It had been a long time since there had been substantial changes to it. And there obviously were some challenges particularly related to uh, um, Aboriginal uh, communities and, uh, and other stakeholders as well and some challenges that were occurring. So we made that commitment to do so. The Premier reaffirmed that commitment uh, when he announced the Far North Land Use Planning Initiative uh, the, this past summer. So and now you uh, brought this bill forward. And I want to I yeah. break our discussion up into three areas. We want to start with Southern Ontario, sure. then go north where you're from, and then talk about <coughs> Aboriginal issues. You were getting, I gather, an earful from cottage owners, particularly in the south, that they needed greater protection for their land from prospectors. What have you done about that? Well, as, as you pointed out in the graphic, 1.4% of uh, landowners in, in southern Ontario actually do not own their mining rights. They own their surface rights, and there were instances of uh, um, exploration companies going in, prospectors going in and, uh, and mining on their property. We recognized that was a challenge. We committed to dealing with that and resolving that problem, and we have uh, made the determination that indeed the best way is to remove the mining rights uh, in terms of their ability to be staked. Will this satisfy them? Um, I, I think they're, they're, they're happier, there's no question about it. I think it does make them happy. I've received some very positive responses to that. Uh, we are keeping the existing claims and leases in place, but we're setting up new rules that will require notification, will require environmental remediation, and I think that's having a significant improvement so as well. So if you already staked a claim, though, you're kind of, you're in, right? You've got, your, you've got an existing claim or lease, mm -hmm. that's correct. And, uh, but we will have a new set of uh, rules that are in place. Regulations will be put in place that will require you to have a different notification system that will require environmental remediation. And I think, generally speaking, I'm receiving a pretty positive response. How about compensation for affected landowners? Uh, we're, we're in the position where we are able to, to pr bring forward the, the, the improvements that we've been able to make. We're, we're moving the mining land tax for people who, have got, who own property and, they were, um, um, and there's no mining going on, but they were still being charged a mining land tax. We're allowing them to, uh, to uh, make an application for an exemption from the mining land tax. Uh, that was something that was a real grievance as well. Mm -hmm. So we think that's going to be received very positively. Do, I mean, some people may find this incredible that if you, if you have property, that doesn't mean that you can prevent a prospector from staking a claim on your property and going ahead. Um, d does that sound funny to you? 
Well, it, it certainly was one of the issues that was clearly an important one for us to put in part of our scope of the Mining Act review, and that's why we did it. We recognized, particularly in southeastern Ontario, may I say, uh, this was a very uh, vexing problem for them. I heard from a lot of people about it, and we felt that we could make this decision. We think it's the right one, and quite frankly, uh, even uh, people who are obviously uh, mining uh, uh, companies themselves uh, had no strong objections to us moving forward in this regard. So it was a situation that had occurred. A lot of people didn't even know that they didn't own their mining rights, and uh, these things were happening. But uh, as I said, we made a commitment to resolve it. I believe we've uh, we've done exactly that. And as I said, uh, generally speaking, I've uh, received a, a very good uh, response okay. from people. Your job, obviously, is to find the balance between those who want to mine, those who want their property it's protected. The word we all use all the time is balance. Balance is That's the word. The challenge. So tell me this: uh, Should local communities <clears throat> have input into plans that would prevent any exploration activity on land already claimed by mining companies? as you look for that balance? Well, we, we're, generally speaking, we're talking about crown land, obviously, but, but in, in certain parts of the province, and this is where we, we can begin to talk a bit about Northern Ontario, I mean, there is a different perspective in Northern Ontario. Uh, obviously, uh, communities like Sudbury, Timmins and Red Lake are virtually built on mining land, mm -hmm. which is why we are uh, certainly uh, going to allow people to, to make a claim to have their mining rights exempted or, or taken away uh, in terms of staking a claim. But we do think that, that people in Northern Ontario view things in a very, very different way. They recognize mining is a huge economic driver, a great employer, and obviously there are great opportunities. So we are certainly wanting to be sure that indeed that opportunity is there, but we want to look at the uh, the mineral potential, but uh, uh, we think it's still the right move to make. Okay, because uh, again, this may be th seen through the filter of a southern prism, and therefore, um, you know, if it doesn't quite work, well, you've suggested northerners think of it differently, but let's, let's pursue that a little bit. Could you not also infer, by forcing northerners to get an exemption, that they're being treated a bit like second-class citizens here? Not at all. I think what it shows is a real sensitivity to the fact that Northerners uh, recognize the importance of mining as an economic b benefit to the to the North. I mean, we have uh, obviously uh, m most of the working mines are in Northern Ontario. Uh, most people are very, very supportive of that. There are great other opportunities that are there as well. So I, I do think it's well understood. Certainly, there will be those who will apply for that exemption, and I think certainly there will be those who will be granted that exe exemption. And if they don't get it, do they have any recourse? Well, we we certainly want to be able to look at it in a fair manner and that's what we're going to do we think that's important but we we had consultations all across the province certainly in northern Ontario also in southern Ontario Kingston Toronto certainly in the north where you're, you, you you heard from prospectors and mining communities and the the mayors and councils of these communities and what they wanted was to be sure that we didn't uh, tip that balance the wrong way they wanted us to be very positive about maintaining a positive investment climate for the mining sector so that was so our decisions were very much based on the, the quite remarkable consultation process that we went through uh, over the last six months and certainly that is uh, I think reflecting how northerners feel. I should know this off the top of my head and you're going to help me because I think I forgot the <clears> number. <throat> Uh, revenues to the Ontario government on an annual basis through mining taxes, I'm guessing about like $200 million or something it's, like that? It's, 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 a, it's a bit less than that, but well, it's... No, it's but uh, but normally, it's, it's yeah, half that this year, that's right? That's right. It's, uh, these are normally it's two, but yeah, now it's about are, one? Yeah, absolutely. They're significant revenues. So is anything that you've got planned here going to be encouraging enough to the mining community to get them to go out there to do more mining so you'll get more revenue. Well, one of the most encouraging things about this process was was the support that we got from the mining companies to make these modernization changes. Uh, I mean, w including uh, the extension of the uh, consultation process with our Aboriginal stakeholders. We had to extend it twice because there was a need for more discussion, and that came forward from the mining companies. They very much asked for clarity and certainty in terms of the rules, and I think if you look at what we proposed to put in place if the legislation is passed is we'll provide that clarity and certainty and in fact we think we'll have a, a better investment climate and certainly that's what I'm hearing from the mining companies, the explorationists and others. Tell me this, because again this may <coughs> sound funny to people who don't, you know, who aren't aware of the history of mining in the province, but right now in the north a prospector can still walk onto somebody's private land and stake a claim with no notification at all. Why can you do that? Well, I mean, the Mining Act is a, is a rather old piece of legislation. We recognize there was a need for a modernization. The Premier felt very strongly about that, and that's why we put these new rules in place. And one of the things that we are moving to, uh, certainly more quickly in southern Ontario, is map staking. We believe what that does that mean? Map staking means that you basically, uh, either on a paper basis or on a, on a computer w website, can go there and, and look at the land and decide you want to stake that particular piece of property. So we are going to be moving to that, phasing it in in northern Ontario over the, over the next 
three to five years. And uh, we think that's going to also be a, a very positive in terms of, uh, of attracting investment to the province. So we want to be able to uh, deal with that, with the issues that you just mentioned, by moving towards a map staking process. And we think it's going to be successful. Okay, but again, wh you know, when is private property not private property? You know, when a mining company can just decide it wants to mine on your land without notification? Well, again, as you pointed out, a very, very small percentage of, uh, of people uh, in the province, let alone in northern Ontario, do not own their, do not own their, their, their subsurface mining rights. So Why would there be a difference? Um, it's it's uh, it's it's one of the uh, sort of anomalies in the in the property tax the property system I guess and mm -hmm. we just recognize that the way that we could resolve this one is certainly very clearly in southern Ontario by making a decision to uh, to to remove the mining rights and to return them to the crown and in northern Ontario to, using the same rules but more flexibility uh, giving ourselves an opportunity to still see if there's mineral potential there to be able to move forward and to again find that balance I mean boy throughout the entire process there's nothing I said more often than this is about finding a balance. There were many divergent views, as you can imagine, throughout mm -hmm. the discussions. It was a remarkable consultation process where we brought people right into the process, right on into the table, and 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 quite frankly, even showed them where we were going to make sure that indeed we were going to receive support. And certainly, when we introduced it, we did receive uh, substantial support well, from me, a number of different sectors. Let me find out if one of those sectors is First Nations. Sure. I know that on your press releases, you've got quotes from some <coughs> grand chiefs saying that they're pleased with the direction you took. However, uh, two issues here, economic yep. development and notification. Yep. Do you think that under the new rules, First Nations will be adequately notified of when mining companies want to do drilling on their land? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, I do. Uh, there, this, is, th th this legislation is groundbreaking in a number of ways. We are, we, are lit we, are, we are putting the Aboriginal and Treaty Rights right in the purpose statement of the legislation. We are going to be requiring Aboriginal consultation with our Aboriginal communities from the moment the, 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 the claim is staked to every from that point over. We're going to have exploration plans and permits required, including remediation. I do think that the reason why we have received substantial support from uh, many First Nation leaders, Grand Council Chief uh, John Bocage, Ontario Regional Chief Angus Toulouse and others in many First Nation uh, chiefs is because we have moved the we have made such great strides we have shifted the process in a way that still works for the uh, mining companies because in fact what we've done is you look at the best practices the Victor Diamond Mine at Wapiscat mm -hmm. is a good example De Beers would not move forward until they had got an impact benefit agreement in place with their First Nation communities until they had that kind of uh, agreement. And I think, quite frankly, what we're doing, we're proposing to, to put that into a legislative framework. How so, yes, I do think it'll it'll be a, a vast improvement uh, and, as I say, quite groundbreaking. We're, we're the only jurisdiction in Canada, in fact, that's got this in the legislation. Okay, that's notification. How about economic development? Now, here's the next question. Do you think you need to put in legislation an obligation on the part of mining companies to employ First Nations people when they do their work? Well, we certainly are very much encouraging, uh, you know, the um, impact benefit agreements with First Nations. There's memorandum of understanding. Right you're, now, you're they're not obligating them to do it, though. Um, right? No, we're not obligating them. But it, the fact is, in the, in the to be honest about the world that we live in. Uh, I think the, the, the companies <clears throat> that do move forward successfully recognize that they need to find uh, a, a process by which they can come to agreement with the First Nations in order to proceed. And as I say, if you look at the companies that have been successful, there are over 50 um, you know, agreements uh, that are in place right now, and you look at those examples, that's a best practice being used by the companies. Which they they've done without government intervention. That so is to correct. Speak. And these are, these are between the, uh, the, the company or the junior exploration company and the First Nation. And, uh, you know, certainly I don't think the, the First Nation communities or the Aboriginal communities would want us to tell them what they should have mm -hmm. in that agreement. But certainly uh, they recognize in order for a successful mine to, uh, to move forward, they need to have that agreement, and they're very keen to see those rules put in place, which is really what our goal is with this legislation. And when do you think this legislation will be passed and into law? Well, we're in second reading right now. We hope to get it through second reading before the end of the spring session. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we will be moving forward on a public consultation around the province. I think that's an important part of the process. We'll have third reading in the fall. There will be a lot of work to do with the regulations. The devil's in the details, as they say. Always is. And there are lots of details to work out, but we're going to keep working with our stakeholders, with our Aboriginal partners, with the mining sector, with the environmental movement, to make sure that we stay close to them on all these issues. So we're hoping that by the end of the year, 2009, we'll have uh, potentially have royal assent. We're grateful you could come in and talk to us about it tonight. Michael I can't Gravel. The time is over. It goes fast, doesn't yeah, it? it? Goes I told very, you it would. It goes very fast. That's Michael Gravel, Northern Development and Mines Minister for the Province of Ontario. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. It's been great.